and good morning. Many thanks for joining us on the webinar today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Richard Bates. I'm Sales Director of EBS. Um, we are Electronic Business Systems. We're abbreviated uh, or abbreviate that to EBS. And we've been established for over 40 years and are a long standing SAGE partner. Uh, in fact, we have about 30 years um, of reselling SAGE 50 and 200 products in various different forms, so lots of experience. We're partnered with Cycon, who joined us today. Um, and um, we specialise in retail, wholesale, distribution and manufacturing solutions. Um, so EBS and Cycon have a number of joint customers benefiting from this integration already. Um, and we wanted to share this with you today. Um, but before we proceed, just to let you know, we are recording the session. Um, so uh, we'll obviously share this out uh, afterwards. Um, but any questions that you have, please pop them in the chat uh, and we'll try and answer those towards the end. Um, but yeah, without further ado, I'll pass you over to Steve Jemitz, the Sales Director of Cycon, uh, to talk to you and demonstrate uh, Cycon Manufacturing. Thanks, Richard. Uh, good morning, everybody. So hopefully you can see my screen with a mouse moving around and uh, as I scroll up and down on the Cycon website itself. Now, in Teams, uh, you may or may not be aware of this, but top right hand corner, you've got your red leave button. Please don't click on that. You've got your microphone, your camera, and then just to the left of that, you've got three horizontal dots. Now, if you left mouse click on there, often there's an option to go into focus or full screen mode. Doesn't always make a difference, but it might just increase the real estate for you just to make it slightly more legible. So in terms of Psycon, just a very quick introduction. We are classified by Sage as an ISV or an independent software vendor. Essentially, we're accredited to create add-ons into Sage 200. And the directors have been doing this for an excess of 20 years, and we only develop for Sage 200. So um, we've been doing that for an excess of 20 years. Now, all of these add-ons on the website that you can see are for Sage 200. That's all we developed for. Uh, and we are just the same as Sage 200 in what we call the off-the-shelf arena. So it does mean it's configurable, but it's within a design framework. So we're not writing bespoke one-off solutions. Everybody's on the same code set. That said, we do have two releases a year, and those releases contain features that customers are asking for. Now, in terms of the manufacturing and number of those elements, we've had them in the marketplace for, for many, many years. But actually, in January of last year, uh, we signed an agreement with Sage to move a number of our uh, modules, so specifically around manufacturing, onto the Sage marketplace, where they're now um, underwritten by Sage and, and sold through that platform. So what that means is, again, very much a joined up relationship. So EBS being your primary contact, Psycon then in the mix, yourselves, so a nice lovely triangle, and then uh, Sage just sitting behind that. So in terms of manufacturing, now, because we installed inside of the Sage system, today you will not necessarily know where Sage stops and Cycon starts or vice versa. That's how fully integrated it is. The manufacturing module is available as a suite or individual elements, depending again on your requirements. So the manufacturing suite comes with works order processing, MRP, projects and kitting or as I say, you can purchase the elements individually. So first things first, we use Sage's stock module. We also use Sage's bill of materials for those of you who um, have a requirement for, for, for bond building. So the works or processing module, first off, will take a snapshot of that bill of materials, if that's the way you're going to work. But from that point, it's gonna then handle what materials, the costing, labour, etc. And you can do whatever you like to that works order without affecting the original bomb. So again, it's great and it's nice and flexible. So that's going to handle what components you require, any subcontract elements if necessary, operations and those and, and uh, the cost as you book in the finished items. To complement that, then you've got material and resource planning or MRP as some people will know it. There's two sides. First side is all about the material. So looking at the bigger picture, suggesting what you need to order or what you need to make when you need to make the quantity as well as any warnings uh, potential issues as well the other side is what we call rough cut capacity planning so looking at uh, the operations and the demand from the works orders on there uh, against your teams and the reason it's rough cut is we're not looking at skill sets or anything like that but it, it is just giving you an idea of are you close or over or under capacity those two are by far and away the most popular of the suite Projects one's an interesting one. Now we've got some clients who they have multiple works orders, which they manufacture. 
and then they need to install them. So there's they're manufacturing for a project. So where this can come in, so option number one is you've got income from your sales. You've got the cost inside of your project of the, the manufacturer build, so from your works orders. You've got labor costs for your team installing it. You might have ancillary costs or expenses, mileage or hotels, etc. So there's your overall project profitability. We've also got clients who actually just use projects for manufacturing. So we've got a boat manufacturer in uh, Pembrokeshire who make bespoke uh, boats, so one off. So, so we did look at bill of materials and work sources, which seems the obvious choice, but for them it was too restrictive. So they actually used the project. So again, they've got income from the sales to the customer. They've broken it down into uh, a structure, so the prop assembly, etc. But they they can do planned purchases. They've got the stock that they issue, the cost of that, the labor timesheets come against it. So again, they can start to track their actual versus budgets. So it is an interesting one, but it's not for every manufacturing organization. And then finally, kitting. Uh, kitting is a lovely little module. Um, it's essentially a single level bomb. Now, the way it was described to me when I joined the company seven years ago is imagine a box of wine. So you've got a box of summer wine, and I'm still going to hang on to summer, even though the weather's changing. A box of summer wine is the 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 kit is made up of four red, four white, four rosé. So you can either build those kits for stock, in which case you take those bottles out of stock and then book in the finished kit, and then sell it to your customer. Or your customer wants a box of summer wine, so you add it to your sales order. You can then build your kit, but you haven't got any Malbec. So swap it with a couple of nice bottles of Merlot. So it gives you a bit of flexibility to be able to, again, consume the components, book the box in at the rolled up costs and then to be able to dispatch. So that's why, as I say, most customers where we'll focus on a WAP and MRP, the kitting and projects are quite niche in terms of uh, whether or not they'd be relevant. And then we have a couple of uh, um, complementary. Now, the, when I say complementary, I don't mean they're free. I mean, they complement the Sage uh, Sidecon portfolio. One of those is shop floor data capture. So this is where the portfolio differs slightly. So this actually sits outside of Sage 200, but it is communicating real time via a web API. So what we've de developed is an Android app to run on an Android device where your production floor can log in, clock on and clock off of operations. So you're recording their actual time as well as how many they've made at that particular section. So again, we'll show you that. And then the other one is around barcoding and warehousing. So for those of you who uh, at the moment are receiving stocking, passing bits of paper around the uh, around the office, this again using Android based technology, so an Android barcoding device means the warehouse can good to receive a PO straight into stock. So you've got a live update. They can move stock around. We can move allocated stock as well. So if you've allocated it to a works order, we can actually allow them to move that stock where they wish the allocation follows. They can pick and dispatch sales orders, do your stock take. So again, it's about using technology to reduce the admin. Now, of course, you could go big bang with all of those, but often the best approach is to phase that through. So what we'll do, we'll look at standard Sage stock first, Sage's bill of materials. We'll move through into works orders. We'll look at MRP, both sides of it. In between, we'll look at the shop floor, and if we've got time at the end, I'll very quickly touch on the barcoding and warehousing. And as Richard said, we've got the chat function. So as I go through, if you've got any questions, please let me know. So hopefully everybody's familiar with Sage 200. Now I've got every single Sycon add-on installed, which is why my menu's a lot busier. And other than the fact it says Sycon works on the processing, you wouldn't know that that's a not a Sage module. As I said, that's how fully integrated it is. So if we start with stock, so um, Obviously, that's central to everything. In terms of your stock items, we're, as I said, we're using Sage's stock. So in terms of your product groups, costing method, if your, if your product groups are set up to be batch or serial traceable, again, we're going to inherit what you've got set there. Uh, from a locations perspective, if you've got multiple warehouse locations, we're going to, again, be utilising those. Minimum stock level typically is the one that we'd be using for uh, MRP, so the material planning side of it. So again, I'll come back to that. Sage's bin definitions. So in terms of um, one to nine, which is what you'll have, we've actually hijacked that with our barcoding. So we use two for your pick face. So as Sage is allocating, allocate the quick wins first, then anything in overflow in bulk. And you can then set up your bins. And what we've done is we've actually tweaked that even further. So you can set the bin definition and minimum and maximum to replenishment as well. 
From a supplier's perspective, again, standard Sage, multiple suppliers, you'll always have one of them as a preferred supplier, and that's the one we're going to hook into from a material planning perspective. And again, we're going to use things like the lead time, so working backwards, so we need it at the end of the month, working backwards, in this case, 15 working days to give you a suggestion of when you should place the order. If you've got list prices, again, pulling from there, and then using uh, usual order or minimum, and again, I'll touch on those as we go through. The only other difference that you may have is a sign on tab here. And again, just some settings which override things like material planning, join or exclude. Again, don't worry too much about that. So that's your stock. Now, whether it's a phantom, whether it's a bomb built item, whether it's a component, all sits in the stock module there. From a, not a barcode and warehouse, and the bill of materials side of things, where it's set up as to be a bomb, and I'll pick, uh, I'll pick the Arizona kitchen bomb just for, uh, just for this example here. So again, Sage is standard bill of materials. So to make one of these kitchens in this example there, these are the components we require. You can have sub-assemblies in there, again, multiple levels. We've got a phantom in here, so that's just going to explode the components in there into that level. New units of measure, so all the raw materials. We also then hook into operations. So this would be the sequencing through uh, the, uh, the plant as, as, you, as you manufacture whatever it is you're doing. So again, this would be different for, for, for each sort of section, but things like your resources. So is there machine resource? So we've got some machine set up, which is a fixed length of zero hours. So that's uh, that's pretty, you've got to work pretty quick. Um, and then you've got your labor resource, which is four hours per kitchen, essentially. So you can set those up. You can have subcontracts as well. So that would be your static data. So I always think of your stock and your bill of materials as your static data. And if you've got that set up really well, then the rest of it will flow through. And because we're all sat in Sage 200, all your project costing, et cetera, is going to, uh, going to flow through as you would expect. So in terms of a works order, a number of different ways of creating a works order. The first one is you can come in, so I'll minimize that a sec, you can come in and click on create works order, pick your bill of materials, and uh, as I say, it'll take a snapshot. You can create an empty works order. So if you wanted, I don't know, perhaps a prototype and you just wanted to add components in, start to build up the costs as you go through, you can do that. We can also do estimates. You can have templates as well. You can generate a works order off the back of a sales order. So if I come into my sales order list just for a second. So uh, if I just amend or just view this particular one. That's one I prepared yesterday. Ignore this pop up and the next one. That's just other cycle add ons. So as I created a sales order and I added our Arizona kitchen bomb on there. What it did is I had a pop up and said, do you want to create uh, a job and a, pro um, a works order and a project? I said yes. So it's actually created me a works order with the number mirroring the sales order. So your sales team can see where we are in the in the process. If you don't want the sales team generating the works orders, that's great. They can put the orders on. The other option you've got is you can generate works orders from sales orders. So this is just going to be a list of sales orders that require you to manufacture. So more of a uh, make to order type scenario. Or if you do a bit of both, we can run material planning and include the, uh, the, the works orders in suggestions in there as well. So in terms of what does a works order look like? So if I just come into my process works order screen, I can see there my Arizona kitchen that we had earlier. And as I expand, because I've got a couple of sub assemblies, we can see the structure. So the 001 means it's line number one on the sales order. Forward slash one means it's sub assembly number one of line number one, et cetera, et cetera. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to edit that and we'll come into, come into that particular works order. And again, we can start to see some of the details. So as I edit this, it's going to open this up. And if you remember the bill of materials that you saw earlier, basically it's exploded all of those components into the materials tab here. There's my sub assembly, which I can right mouse click and open up from within here if I wish to. I can see the quantity we require, the quantity we can change as well, and you'll see then a comparison. So perhaps you've got someone like myself working in your production facility. I'm pretty sure your scrappage would go up. Uh, certainly I know. I know what my DIY skills are. So if that is the case and we need to edit the elements, we can add extra items into here. And then you set up just a list of reasons why we've had to change. So again, you've got some, uh, some, some tracking there as well. 
we've got the concept of allocation. So what allocation does in Sage's world is it ring fences that stock. So you might have 10 in stock and you've got 10 free, 10 available. If Richard allocates five of those, you've still got 10 in stock, but your free stock goes down to five. Picking is an option if you want to, and we can pick via the barcoding device. Issuing is then what consumes and down dates your stock and it moves the cost then into, into your whip area. And then we can book the finished item in. And again, we've got plenty of flexibility. We can change the view. So if I want to see the units of measure, for example, if we've got purchase orders coming in, that's a link to this. So I can see the, the PO. Because what you can do is you can, if you didn't want to use material planning, and we've got some clients just use works orders with bill of materials, you can actually generate purchase orders and it will tick the lines with the preferred supplier, given an estimate of the price, which you can overwrite to then generate your purchase orders to buy for the specific production order. We've also then got things like alternative items. So perhaps, I don't know, it could be you've got, uh, let's, let's take a chair, for example. So you've got fabric and there might be 60 different fabrics that you could assign for this one, one particular chair. You could have 60 bill of materials if you wanted to, or have one bill of material with a, a sort of a dummy stock item called fabric. And against that stock item, you have the alternate items, and then you can pick red faux leather, you know, brown leather, whatever that would be. As you select that, it will swap that component in here. And then your cost estimate for the works order starts to update. So if it's uh, obviously, if it was a sway, then that's going to be cheaper than if it's um, uh, a more expensive leather type item. So you can start to see the estimated cost, which becomes an actual cost as you issue the components, again, depending on your costing method set up in the static data. In terms of the finished items, again, we can edit the quantity that we can have the finished goods. We've got a, a number of clients. Uh, in fact, we've got a mutual EBS client who they work in the composite sector. So depending on the ambient temperature, they get a greater or lesser yield in terms of the, the finished product. So for them, it's important to be able to change the quantity they're going to get out because that will affect whether it's a higher cost per unit or a lower cost per unit. So we've got flexibility there. I mentioned operations, so here's the sequencing. So again, it's just taken those resources and exploded them. We've got work patterns in the background for the various different teams. And you can see I've completed a couple already and we can see the completed quantity. So we know where, we, where we're working. Likewise, because I use the shop floor data capture, there was my time from yesterday. If I just edit that, you recorded the actual time I spent on that particular operation. And we can then start to compare the estimate versus how much time I actually spent. And we've got here in terms of the right run time. Now, what I'm actually going to do is I'm just going to clock onto my operation and start the clock just so you can see a bit about the shop floor data capture. So what I've done is I've just printed my root card. So again, one option you've got is we can print off a root card. And whilst it seems a great idea to go paperless, often customers still have a bit of paper to follow. Um, it's uh, it's probably a bit of a comfort blanket, but it's also good just to uh, just to have that. But if and if you do, you can also have unique barcodes on those particular items. So I'm going to scan this one in a moment. Now I'm going to bring up the shop floor data capture. So all I'm doing is I've got my Android device here and I've just shared the screen. And for those of you who can still see me on camera, this is the device I'm using. It's an all in one with barcoding, but it could be an Android um, tablet. So it could just be a Samsung tablet with a Bluetooth hand scanner if you want to, or you don't have to have the barcodes if necessary. So as a user, I've got a unique pin and I'm going to enter my unique pin and clock into the system. Now it is going to pop up and ask me, I oh, know it isn't, that's fine, I deleted it earlier. There is an update, so I'm going to fly by the seat of my pants. I didn't update it before today, but uh, so I've got a couple of options. I can tap on the screen and I can find the works order if I know the works order number. And again, we've got some clients where um, the business partners built a bespoke dashboard which sits above the, the section so they can see the next operation they should work on. Or if I scan this barcode first, that's going to take me to the top level works order. So not into the individual operation, so I can see how far through we are, the details, any order comments as well. As I swipe through, I can see the various different operations and where we are in the process. And if I keep swiping, in terms of the stock items where we've allocated, so we can see we've allocated here, I can actually click and I can issue and say, I've now, oh, there you 
think oh, I can't. That's not. I'm not given been, been given permission to. But if I was, I could issue those components to the uh, to the order. So essentially, without having to have barcoding, I can consume those uh, those stock items. As I say, if I've got permissions. Instead, I'm going to scan the second operation there, and can have a description of what I should be doing. And I'm going to click on start. Have I got some machine time that complements that as well? So I can uh, I can pick the machine time if necessary and I can click on confirm and that started my activities. So at this point I can now log out and the next person can carry on. So whether you've got one of these devices, so if you're not locked to a specific device, what I'm able to do is I can, I can um, log on to any device it's going to recognize me obviously as long as i've got a login and i can start it some people have devices at each to, uh, at each sort of production area some will have them either end of the of the factory but what's actually happened is if i close all of this and i come back to my works order and i just refresh in terms of my labor time you can now see there's no actuals but we know steve Gemma, obviously myself i'm logged in doing some plumbing which we all know is a lie because I'm sat on this call. So that's that's the kind of the shop floor data capture elements there. Now I mentioned subcontract. So for those of you who um, have some subcontract operations, for a lot of customers, you'll add them in as materials. So as a, as a stock item, you can carry on doing it that way. We do have an option for non-stock. So if you want to generate a purchase order as well for the for the price, but we've got a number of customers who for them, What's quite critical is they need to be able to track what stock they've sent out and what's come back. So we've got uh, a client who's a fence manufacturer. They make all, all different types of uh, fence posts and panels, etc. And for the for the metal side of things, it will be sent out for powder coating or different finishes. So what they what they do is they send a load of these out, but don't wait for them all to be finished before they come back. They come back in drips and drabs. And their issue was they didn't know what was necessarily where where items were being tracked so if i click on add here you can create a you can create a, a, a subcontractor po so i'll pick I'll try and pick a, a component that i've uh, i've got some stock with so i can i can uh, enter po reference whatever that would be a description so some painting and i can say okay actually we uh what should we go with Let's try that one there, 20 of those. So we're going to send those out. And what's the what's the cost for each of them? We'll say £10 or the line cost. And what that's doing is that's creating an operation. Now, if I had that operation set up in the bill of materials, it would automatically be there. And we've got subcontract operation, which I can move around should I wish. So at this point, what I can do is if I edit, I can allocate the stock if I've got enough stock. Which I have, but I can also generate myself a purchase order. When do we need them back? So I'm going to say I want them back tomorrow and apply that to the lines. And what that's done, so that's split my £10 total cost into 50 pence per unit as it books it in. So if I save that, that's generated me a standard Sage purchase order number. So at this point, what I can do then is I can dispatch and I can say, OK, I'm going to send all 20 out to our subcontractor. If I want to print an advice note, again, I'll show you that in just a moment. So if I just save that there, have a look at my spooler, we can then get a nice delivery note with what the items, but obviously I've set one item, but the total number of items being sent out. So we've got a PO to handle the cost, but also inside of our works order, we've now got an operation. So we know where we are in that, but also we can see how many we've dispatched and we haven't received any back yet. More importantly, if I come up into the total cost of the works order, we've now got the cost of the subcontract built in. So at this stage, I could receive the PO if I wanted to, but if I go back into this particular screen, I can now select the lines. I can receive all of them or some of them back, and that's just a final receipt to say I'm receiving everything back for, for that particular line. So if I hit the right keys there, as you have to do in Sage. So this is actually Sage's service received items there. And if I click on save, when we come to, I've got three way matching set up in my system. So when we come to match the invoice, we can see, yes, we've received the items back. So again, just tying nicely into the um, 
into the financial elements. So again, if I just save this, we can now see what we've received back. Now, the other thing I should have mentioned is as I dispatched the items, it also downdated and issued the components as well. So our stocking levels were correct as we sent the items back, sent the items out. Now it's sat in whip, so we don't receive them back into stock because of course you've consumed them, but we can now use them in the next level up. Okay, so in terms of in terms of the basics, I'm gonna leave that just there. The only final thing I just want to just note for yourself there. So I've mentioned, we can see our current issued costs and the estimated cost for this, which will update as we issue components so you get the actual costing. But what you can also do is under the works order summary tab here, at the end of the project or the end of the uh, production order, sorry, we can see the original budget when we first created the works order and then what our actual costs are as well. So again, it's a great way if, you know, if the margin on this particular order was down, you can very quickly see, well, was it materials or was it labor time or was it machine time that's, that has affected this? So again, it might be that we've, uh, I broke one of the items, so we've had to replace it with a more expensive item, for example, in there. So you can see the details, and then as you drill down, you've, you've obviously got visibility of the components. So I'm gonna close this for a moment, and I'm gonna move across to material planning. So let's say the first side is material planning, the other side is rough cut. And what I'm actually gonna do is, I'm gonna run this real time. So I'm gonna get it to check for works orders and for stock, and I'm gonna click on run. Now, I think this is gonna take about four minutes, between four and five minutes. I've got six and a half thousand-ish, I think, stock items, probably 70 or so bills and materials. Of course, if you've got three million stock items and 300,000 bombs, it's gonna take a lot longer than if you've got 30 stock items and three bombs. But we have tried to optimize it. You don't have to kick anybody out of Sage. You can run it as many times as you, as, as, as you want, but each time you run it, it will delete the previous suggestions. So you'll only ever have one live suggestion. Now, it also does depend on the speed of the server, how many people are hammering it as well. But as I say, we have tried to optimize it and you'll notice we've got these start and you'll see an end date, uh, end time uh, in a few moments. Again, should you be implementing this and you think, oh, this is taking forever. That's very hard to quantify, but if you send a screenshot to Richard and the team at EBS, they can then go, oh, okay, it seems to be snagging at that particular section, GDPR forms, copy of the data, and we can then start to identify and try to try to work out why it's uh, why it's going slow there. Now, what is it doing? It's actually doing a heck of a lot of work at the moment. So first things first, it's looking at suggested work sort. So what really underpins our system is something called um, future stock movements. So essentially what we're looking at is that free stock element. So we're ignoring the allocated stock, but just the, the free stock. And then any demand from that. So demand if it's a component for a works order, or it might be a demand if it's a finished product on a sales order. So we need to manufacture it. It's looking at lead times, etc. So for the works orders, it's actually building every single bill of materials. It's exploding that, analyzing all of the components and then removing it and moving on to the next one. So it's doing a lot behind the hood. It's taken into consideration um, lead time from the preferred supplier for the components, your minimum stock level. So if you've got a, an item that you buy to order, your stock, your minimum would be zero. If you've got an item which is faster moving, then you would set an appropriate minimum level for, for that float. So the system's always gonna be looking to bring you back to or just above that minimum level. It's gonna be looking at for a component, usual order quantities. So we have to buy, buy it in bags of 100, for example, or there's a minimum order quantity. We have to buy a minimum of a thousand bottles, over that we could buy a thousand and one, two, three, but there's a minimum level. So it's taking all of those elements into, into consideration. Now there are a lot of settings as you can see here, which you can tweak. So things like at the moment, uh, my stocking levels, I'm using minimum, but I could override that. We've actually got a client we added this in for where they, I don't know if they still use this, but at the time, uh, so this is pre pre pandemic, huge warehouse, and they didn't want to be ordering just in time. They just said, right, as soon as you see we're going to drop below the minimum, order enough to bring us back to or just above the maximum. We've got enough storage space and that, that worked for them and then they run it down. So again, we've got different options in there for that. Things like grouping the suggestions. So at the moment we can see actually on my purchase orders, it's not grouping any of those. So we're going to see separate suggestions. But if I set that to a week, 
anything where the demands within a week is just going to group it into one line with multiple suggestions. Um, you can override that on a stock item by stock item basis. So we've got uh, a client, they have a component that's about £74,000. So for them, it's absolutely critical that they, uh, they for cash flow, that they, they never group it. They don't want to place an order for it. They just order it just in time. So how long did that take? OK, actually three minutes. So I, uh, I overestimated today, which is always always uh, always better. So you can see the start end in times. Now, first things first, I've got warnings now because it's demo data. I've got a lot of stuff in the past, but you might get warnings such as works orders are overdue. So run this this morning. Works order should have been finished yesterday. Systems telling us, well, it's overdue. It might be that we finished it, but we just haven't updated the system. We've got other warnings such as suggested works orders may not be built in time for a sales order. So again, for, for those of you who, who make to order, we've put the sales order on, we've run MRP, and MRP is saying, well, the, the uh, estimated production lead time that we've added to the stock item, uh, or sorry, to the finish bomb is two weeks. Sales order has been put on, they want it this Friday. It's not saying you can't do it, but it's just suggesting and saying, look, there's a good chance you won't be able to. And if you double click, it's going to open up our future stop movement screen so you can start to see the, the impact on that. And again, it's because my sales orders are last year, so definitely won't be built on time, but you can start to see there's the suggestion. And the reason it's suggesting 598 is to bring us back to zero, but it's just saying, look, it's not going to be built in time for those, uh, those sales orders. If I keep scrolling down, you'll also see things such as purchase orders that are overdue. Uh, again, similar scenarios, just not been not been updated. So they might have been received in the yard, but the paperwork's in the office. It's not, Sage hasn't been updated. Or even down to suggested purchase orders may not be arriving in time for a works order. So again, it's not changing anything. It's just purely suggestions, but it's just presenting that information to you. You might see some reschedule messages. So again, just in this instance, the purchase order for these could be rearranged to fulfill demand. So the 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 uh, we had a purchase order on, sales orders moved, so the demands changed. So again, just some simple messages. For those of you who um, deal with traceable items, now what is this freezer hamper? Richard, that should still be fine. 2015 has been frozen, so it should be should be right, shouldn't it? But uh, it's basically telling us we've got stock in there where the sell by and the use by date is is is, is in, in the past essentially. So we've got an issue, or you might have some where it's uh, getting close. In terms of the suggested works order, so what we can see here is we can see the stock item, the description, the quantity it's suggesting, current free stock units of measure, and where it's suggesting we need to make them to when it's suggesting we start them and based on the production times in there when it should be finished. And again, we've got the reasons why. So if I double click on this one, for example, it's for minimum stock. So the system suggesting we need to make 10 because we've got a minimum stock level of 10. It's the same day production estimated lead time for each of them. Current balance is zero, zero is below 10. So it's suggesting we make 10 to bring it back to and the system's happy with that logic. If I want to create my works order, simply tick and you click on create works orders. We then come into suggested purchase orders. So we've got purchase orders coming into stock. But again, for those of you who perhaps have a, a hybrid model where you do a lot of your own manufacturing, but you've also got a distribution arm as well. And we've got clients do that where they are distributing spare parts as well for perhaps the items they're, they're, they're manufacturing. So in that instance, on a sales order in Sage, you can have three fulfillment methods. And apologies if you're already aware of this. First one is from stock. So we're going to be dispatching it from our warehouse. Second is for, um, for direct from the supplier. So it means that we're going to be instructing the buying it for the supplier, obviously shipping it direct. Third one, I don't know many people who do it, supplier via stock, essentially you've got a wagon waiting for when the stock comes in and it bounces in and bounces out. So we do separate based on those fulfillment methods, the suggestions. Now all of mine are here for, are for stock. And the first column is key, what date is the system suggesting we place the PO? So you may well see some dates out into the future. No, I haven't uh, in, today. You can choose whether you place a week's worth today, whether you just place today's. We've got some clients run it twice a day, some will run it twice a week, some run it once a week. Again, it's entirely up to you. It depends on your churn. So we've got the date it's suggesting we place the PO. We've also then got the lead time from the preferred supplier and therefore the requested date. 
stock item details again say just stock you can put also put the uh, manufacturers or sorry the suppliers part code as well we display that the quantities and again we can override this so if you want to order more or less then we can do so units of measure in which warehouse and the current stocking levels your preferred supplier but if i click on the drop down you can also pick from the rest of your purchase ledger so i'm not suggesting for one minute you can nip around to your local hardware store but if there's a supplier that's not set up against the stock item that you wouldn't ordinarily use but it's an, it's an emergency we've got to get this order out it means you can generate a po for them we've got the unit price and again we try to use a bit of logic here so if you've got list prices that's what it's going to display if you haven't, if you've got a live purchase order on the system, it's going to use the most recent one, uh, should be the most recent, you know, most up to date price. If not, the last buying price and as a last resort average, but you can filter up here by supplier and then start to overwrite the prices as you phone through um, with your supplier to get their best price. And then we've got the various different reasons why. So if I just double click a couple of these. Again, it's going to load up my future stop movements. So minimum stock level is zero and I can buy them in each is. So we've got opening free stock of none. We've got a work sort on the system that would bring us negative. So in order to cover that short floor and bring us back to a minimum, there's the suggestion and that will actually be one of my warnings because the dates in the past, it can't fulfill it properly. So for another quick look, see if I can find another example. So what have we got here? Minimum stock level of two, and we have to order in multiples of six. It's a 20 day lead time. So again, we've got our opening free stock. We've got sales orders for reducing the balance, likewise works orders as well. So you can see the balance is going down. Now, if I double click, now you do have to have access to sales orders in terms of your Sage profile, but I can actually drill down to the sales order and, and have a look at the status, you know, of, of, of what, uh, what's on there. Likewise, the works order if I've got access to. Basically down the bottom here, we can see some purchase orders already coming in, which would bring the balance above. Then we've got some further demand from works orders. The system's seen that we're going to drop to one. One is below our minimum level of two, so that's now triggered it to look. Because it has to order in multiples of six, Buying in six brings us to seven, which is above our minimum. The system's happy that it's fulfilled the logic, hence where the suggestion for buying that many in is. Now, if that's a load of rubbish on the right hand side, again, if you've got permission, you can drill down and amend stock item details. And we can then see on things like you could adjust the lead time from the supplier, you could adjust the minimum levels on your on your locations. Now you would have to rerun MRP for it to pick up those new changes, but again, it, you're, it's enabling you to work within the rather than writing it down on scraps of paper, closing that screen and moving to another area. To place your POs, simply tick, oh, you do have to have a supplier, just tick the ones that you want to place, click on create purchase orders. Now where they're from the same supplier for the same delivery location, it will group all of those onto a single purchase order. So in this example here, it would create two purchase orders for me because those two are from the same supplier for the same delivery location. We also have the concept of pre-allocations built in, which you can switch off if you want to, but essentially because we know in this example here that it's buying some for a works order that we've got on the system, it can ring fence or essentially pre-allocate to that purchase order. So for example, We've got a purchase order. Uh, we've got a minimum stock level of uh, of a thousand. We've got none in stock at the moment. We've got a works order requiring 500. So our purchase suggestion would be 1500. If we create a pre-allocation, when we could receive our purchase order, it's going to book 1500 in stock. It's going to leave a thousand in free stock, and then automatically allocate 500 to that particular works order. Is essentially how it works. So that's the material planning side of things. So the other side I mentioned was the rough cut capacity planning. But actually, sorry, one last thing I should mention. Uh, for those of you who um, we've got clients, food sector's a good one. Uh, we've got a, a um, customers in project. They forecast out, they get from, from all the supermarkets, what orders they're likely to need. So they manage that in a spreadsheet. And what they do is they use our import template to import a manual forecast so they haven't got the sales orders on the system yet but because of the lead times they need to be buying 
the items in, they need to be scheduling them. So you can put a support customer in if you wish, but basically the date you require them, the stock item, the quantity and the warehouse. So there is a manual forecast, which you can either manually enter in or import, and the system will include that in the material planning suggestions. So rough cut capacity planning. So the idea behind the system is you've got um, your employees set up, different teams linked to the operations, uh, you've got work patterns so you know your available person resource. So the first one just for the rough cut is orange is that in my example is machine availability, yellow is labour availability. I haven't got any, I've got a little bit of machine demand down there and then labour demand. So I can have a quick look holistically how close are we to overcapacity now? It's not a true reflection because of course that might be made up of different different groups, but I can double click, see the works order and I can keep drilling down if I need to. But if I look at the teams, I can also then I have a look here. I can see are my individual teams or production sort of areas overrun and actually no, we've got more capacity. So that's that's important. You can link specific employees to specific um, operations as well. So if you wanted Richard to work on a certain one, so you can see what they've got to scheduled. You've got your machines demand and availability as well, as well as um, a few machine groups and the individual machines as well. The other end of the scale we can look at is a nice list view. So at the top level works orders, what works orders should we have completed by now? They're overdue. What should we be working on this week? And what have we got scheduled for next week? Of the overdue, if we are using say shop floor, so we, we've got our estimated labour and we're capturing actual as well, we can start to see how much additional labour resource based on what we've used so far and the rest of the remaining estimate to catch up on that backlog. And also what operations are overloaded, you'll see a list of those and the the, uh, the amount of hours in that view. And then we can start to get into um, more, more, more diary type views. So if I look at the operation scheduler, so based on the operations, so looking at specific works orders, being able to see those individual operations. And you can change the scale as well, so I can drill down to hourly, should I wish, start to see, and I can actually move those operations round, should I wish. And that's actually updating our live works order. We can also look at it from the top level works order as well. So again, just what works orders have we got scheduled in the system? And if I want to, I can start to move the whole works order around in there. And again, that's updating the dates on the works orders. So it's it's a sort of diary views that are dynamic. So as opposed to uh, doing this in an Excel spreadsheet and then manually updating your works order. And then we've got other views like team schedule as well. So what we've got scheduled for the various different teams and are we over or under the available person capacity for that day? So again, you get all that as part of the MRP. Some customers, and again, actually in a lot of instances, we've shown you a lot of features. You don't necessarily have to use it all at once. I think for me, if you're looking at a new project, uh, perhaps those of you looking to move to Sage 200 or already on Sage 200 looking to, to move into, into um, at, you know, enhancing your manufacturing production by putting something like this in, is if I was in your shoes, it's important to know that the product's going to grow with you over the next three, five, seven years and beyond. So certainly there's a lot in there, but you don't necessarily have to use it all straight away. OK, so I'm going to come back into my shop floor data capture. So I'm going to log in. Now, again, I could, could have scanned the barcodes, but I've just gone into my activity. And what I can do is I can say, right, OK, I want to stop. Now, a couple of options I've got. First one is I could pause. Perhaps I'm going for a break or lunch or it's the end of the day. And if I do that, it's going to ask me how many have I made? So if I've got, I don't know, if I'm soldering 500 circuit boards and I've done 200, I can pause, say I'm going home or I'm going for lunch and I've made 200 so we know where we are. Or as I'm going to do, I can say I've fully completed both of those. I can now clock on to the next one or as I'm going to do, I'm just going to log out for the moment. But more importantly, if we go back into our works order. By the way, I should point out what you're seeing on screen is I'm logged into a server somewhere with the Sage Cycon add-ons in. My device, which I've got in my hand here, is actually connected to our guest Wi-Fi. So to us, to the secure uh, web API that's connected to that server. So we secure it behind an SSL certificate. So I'm doing this across the internet and you can see how, how uh, 
obviously that's updated, which again, it's nice enough to put a huge uh, infrastructure in. But if I look at my operations, you can now see that one's been completed. Uh, that one's also been completed because I completed the sub, uh, subcontract piece, but we can see the status is complete. So we know we're almost halfway through. And if I look at my labor time, we've now got my cost, which is set up against my uh, my my employee record and then my actual cost based on how long I've spent on that particular operation. And if I edit, you can start to see my timesheet that's been built up on each day and the hours I've spent. So again, you could override that if perhaps I forgot to clock off. And then you've got your estimate versus what we've actually spent in terms of time and cost as well. OK. In terms of completing the works order, you've got a couple of options. So as I already mentioned before, step number one is allocation. Step number two is issuing. So allocation ring fences issue reduces the stock of the components, moves the cost into WIP. And then the final stage is to book. And that's going to take all of those rolled up costs and then book your finished item or items into stock at those costs. The other way of doing it is you can do it at a more holistic level. So you can select multiple works orders, do a bulk allocate, a bulk issue and a bulk book. Now it can only allocate what stock you've got available. It can only issue what stock you've allocated. Uh, and of course, you've got to be careful with the book because that's only going to book the cost that you've got so far into, into stock. But it does allow you to do it at a more holistic level. The other option is we've got a number of customers now. It's not, it's not recommended, which I know all sounds a little bit bonkers, for not recommending something that we've actually built. But there are uh, a number of customers who have to work this way for it could be logistical reasons. It's just everything's so fast, fast paced, but is uh, is back flush, but it's actually bulk back flush. Now I'll explain why we why we don't like it in just a moment. Or why you've got to be careful is probably the better expression. So that's going to show me all of my live works orders on the system. If I click on next, so I say I want to, we've made all of these. That's fantastic. It's going through and just validating. And I've got a load of issues here because it's basically saying, according to Sage, you haven't got enough stock. Now I must have had stock because I made it. And that's where you get your add stock button at the bottom there. Now, not that I've ever worked in a manufacturing environment, but my, my my logical side of my brain says, well, we must have had stock. So why why is our stock level in Sage? And what we've got, on, you know, what what what's breaking down in the process? So it is there, and we say we've got clients successfully using that. You've just got to be careful in terms of your stock levels. Now, that leads me quite nicely actually onto the barcoding. So often some of the issues is you've got to get the stock out the door. So you need to you need to do your bulk back flush and then you'll just use the stock take to, uh, to adjust your stock. And that's because the stock's come in the warehouse. It's been consumed straight away in the production area before the paperwork has been manually updated in Sage. And this is where something like barcoding really comes in because because it's again, it's tied using that same API technology. It's tied to your your Sage database things like if we if we put on a, uh, a purchase order so now whether this is a purchase order that I'm just going to manually put on or whether this is one that's um, whether this is one that's uh, generated from the back of material planning for example it's the same thing as a purchase order so let's go for Christian Cullen that'll do so we want the items in tomorrow let's add just a couple of items in so my good old espresso machines so I buy them into the warehouse, we'll go for four of those, and then we'll add on some cups as well. So if I just save. So there's our PO 3886. Now, without me doing anything, as in what I mean by anything, obviously I've got to pick up my device, but without me having to um, synchronize or anything like that, I've got to, you've got to use a logins in terms of the barcoding. So when I log in, it recognizes who I am. I need to log into the appropriate warehouse that I want to transact with. Again, there's lots of settings about what you can lock down, but if I go to receive purchase orders, and I'm just going to scroll right to the bottom, 
and there it is there, third from the bottom, 38.86. So if you bear with me, let me just refresh the list. You can see there 30, 38.86 is the one that I added on. And if I click on the PO, so it comes through the door, that's now pulling down the outstanding quantities. There's our four coffee machines and cups. Now my barcodes, I think, are in my bag somewhere. So we've actually got three clients using this. There's no barcodes on the items that come in, but you can print labels and stick them on and use the barcodes later. So I'm just going to click on the plus. Now I'm not allowed to overwrite. I can enter the quantity in the center there. So I've got both of those. I could swipe this along and print labels if I wanted to. If I've got a label printer, they're all designed for zebra type printers. But if I go confirm receipt, I have to enter a GRN number. That's the document number that you saw earlier uh, in Sage. If I say yes, that's been received. And I'm doing this as quickly as I can. That stock has now been received in Sage. So if I view the line, I view the deliveries. User called Steve, that's myself, has received them in today. Obviously, if they've been batch or serial traceable, I'd have had to have entered the appropriate batch or serial number. But this is where the benefit of, again, just using technology, which is updating standard Sage, can speed those elements up. So now that stocks in and can be allocated, or if you've got the pre-allocation, can be pre-allocated. I can even move the stock round. So if I, if I uh, just come in here a second and look at the history, we can see there's our PO and it's been received. It's currently in a good Zim bin. So if I go to my put away, so you've got a team of people receiving, that's got to put away some stock. And if I search for my espresso machines, you see there's the four machines there. It shows me where in the warehouse we typically store them. So let's go and move them into AA01. And by the way, as I say, now scanning barcodes would uh, would be would be perfect, but I don't need to. Let's move my 23. Actually, we'll put those into AA01 as well. So let's move all 23 of those. But what that's done is if we come back into Sage, we can now see a user called Steve has moved four from Goods In to AA01. And if I went to look at my cup, exactly the same. So it means from a barcoding perspective, I can be moving that stock around. Now, in terms of time, I haven't got time to go through the other elements, but just some of the available features that you've got. You can pick and dispatch sales orders. So again, uh, there's options there of how you release those sales orders, but telling me where in the warehouse the stock's been allocated. Uh, you, if you've got a team of pickers and a team of packers, the pickers can do the picking and print the packing list. The packers can pick up the packing list and do the packing and the dispatching. So you've got that option. You can, it could be the same person. We can do wave picking. So rather than a back and forth, go and pick 10 orders and then you can pack them individually. You can move stock. So if you've got multiple locations, you need to move stock. Perhaps you've got stores. You know, we've got some clients where they've got shops that they need to replenish. You can dispatch stock transfers and then receive them in at the other end. Um, move stock around the warehouse, add stock, write stock off. Um, even, as I said, if I haven't got it set up for this user, but being able to pick and dispatch, uh, sorry, pick an issue uh, for works orders from the handheld as well. So again, tied into Sage, but also the Cycon elements to give you that full solution. So just to just to re recap, obviously the manufacturing, we've covered off the what the MRP at a high level today. We've looked loosely at the shop floor data capture and a little bit of the barcoding. Um, the final one, just to touch very, very quickly, projects. So just so you can see what a project looks like. And if I just filter my list now, whether or not it's just linked to a uh, production order or whether it's a um, an actual project, but essentially because it's sat in Sage, we have 100% nominal to project reconciliation. And what I mean by that is every nominal transaction is recorded against a project, whether it's a non-applicable for things that aren't project related or whether it's a um, uh, an actual an actual project number. But very quickly, we can start to see the current margin. We've got you can set budgets as well, start to see how you're comparing against budgets, commitments and actual so purchase orders that have yet to be received or invoiced. You've got all of your income from any sales, expenditure from any purchase invoices, purchase orders, timesheets. So if you were actually recording time, as I mentioned, perhaps an installation stocks, so whether that's issued stock or whether it's stock that's linked to a works order. 
but it gives you that overall profitability. There's a lot more in there, you know, if you have to hire in plans or uh, additional plan purchases, but it all ties together. So what I would say is um, just before, see if there's any questions, feel free to visit the Cycon website. We don't track you at all, cycon.co.uk. Have a look at the help and user guides. So there's screenshots and descriptions of all the various different elements that I will have could have gone through today. It's designed for customers who've had training as a live help guide, but I think it's quite nice at this stage for you to just have a quick flick through and, and look at those features. But appreciate your time. I'd love to keep uh, keep talking about a bit more, but obviously conscious I've got three minutes left. Richard, are there any questions in the chat? Brilliant stuff. Yeah, I've got a couple of questions just to while, well, while you have a drink and catch your breath. But <laughs> um, obviously, if anybody else uh, has any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat now or quite happy to set up a, an, another session with you to discuss, you know, maybe exactly your exact requirements and how you might want to use the system. Um, I guess the first question is um, obviously Sage 200 manufacturing is available. Um, how easy is it to move? So you know, we are aware that you know, Sage 200 manufacturing is end of life. This is the natural version to move across to. Is, is it an easy transition? Yes. So um, great question. What we what we did was when we were first looking at um, obviously moving this uh, onto the Sage marketplace, we knew the migration question was going to come up and the obvious one was to go well okay let's try and move all of the data um into our into our tables and what we've suddenly realized is that's kind of fraught with challenges any data migration is always always difficult because people use it in so many different ways so what we've actually done is you can install the Cycon works orders and mrp alongside your sage and uh, we've tweaked our material planning so it looks at the material requirements in your existing sage works orders so what customers will do, obviously you do all your testing in your, in your test customer company, but when you want to go live, any new works orders or production orders, you, you start using the Cycon one and you just run down any existing ones that you've got in the Sage manufacturing. So that will start to deplete, at which point you moved over. But in the meantime, any stock demand is picked up with our material planning. From that point, a couple of options there is, the data still remains in the table, Sage tables. So again, that might be where Richard and the team write a couple of bespoke reports, depending on what you want to pull out. Uh, so you could switch off the Sage manufacturing or you could keep works orders on there if you wanted to. But that we thought and feedback from our partners and existing customers seemed the most sensible way of doing it. Brilliant stuff. Um, and one other question. Um, so is there any way of updating my reorder levels based on previous history? Um, yeah, so not reorder level, um, but um, we do have a, a utility. So as uh, if you have a look down on the left hand side, we've got um, a solution called distribution. Now it's made up of nine separate elements. So you just purchase the ones that are relevant. Uh, and you'll notice there's material planning there. So this is for clients who don't have manufacturing requirements, as, but still want purchase order suggestions. So the one that we went through for manufacturing what complements is something called future sales. Now, what this does is it can look at historical usage. Now, usage is anything where you've dispatched on a sales order, consumed it in a works order, written it off as well. There's a uh, so we analyze that out of the box, the rolling last 13 weeks, but you can put a date range. So if you are seasonal, you know, you could put October to December last year and it will analyze the usage during that period to give you an average monthly usage. There's then a calculation which Basically, is your demand divided by the number of working days you've set up in the background of the system. You've then got your lead time from your preferred supplier. You can have a stock coverage. So, you know, we want 10% uh, or 50% coverage, whatever that would be. Based on all of those calculations, it will then come back with what it thinks you should adjust the minimum level to. So for something which you're not selling or you're not using, of course, you want that to be as close to worth not zero because you don't want to be holding stock but something that's faster moving you want to ensure that you've got enough stock to cover you in the time of ordering so so certainly that's where future sales even other things there for seeing a lot more organizations now shipping in from the far east so of course you've got very long lead times loading containers with multiple po lines so being able to track a container with different tracking profiles and as you update that perhaps it's delayed just as it was in the Suez Canal being able to see when you run material planning what that's going to impact as well so again we've got this whole ecosystem of, of solutions but apologies Richard to answer your question <laughs> is yes 
<laughs> yeah, no, all very relevant. I mean, the container management one is just, yeah, it's an amazing little add-on and, and, and simple. Um, and it's something that we've seen a huge demand for, you know, like say Brexit and uh, containers as well. So, um, yeah, you know, COVID and, uh, you know, containers going into different areas and different ports that they shouldn't be. So I think everybody's having a bit of a nightmare with that. But uh, yeah, I mean, I have to say, I think 60 percent, I mean, it's, it's a round, rounded figure, but uh, speaking to the team and in my experience, 60 percent of any demonstrations we're doing at the moment have an element of distribution in there just because it touches so many areas, you know, c companies who even in manufacturing still, you know, you want to track those minimum levels in terms of, you know, what 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 are the faster moving goods and they'll no doubt be doing it in some form of spreadsheet somewhere. So it makes sense if the system can help you, then it, then um, then why not use the system? Exactly. Yeah, got to make your life a little bit easier. But uh, that's it for questions um, in, well, that I've got. Obviously, if there are any others, uh, feel free to you know send them across to ourselves and um, just thank everybody for their time and thank you Steve for doing the demonstration. Not at all really appreciate everybody taking the time out of that and uh, hopefully you know, happy to jump on a one-to-one -one demonstration with Richard and the team if uh, if you want to uh, see a bit more but thank you. Definitely we'll share out the video for this and um, there's lots of other videos on our YouTube channels as well including distribution um, so we'll share a link to that as well. Thanks ever so much.